Max Future. Okay, welcome to the iPad Podcast. And this is episode 42. And this is coming out on February 20th. And it's by the MaxFuture.com website. So let's get to it. There's been a really interesting week of news. And by the way, you can get the video version of this podcast, which is actually uh, some images and slideshows that go along with the audio. You can get it at, at on iTunes. I have a video podcast that aggregates the video version of both this podcast and the Apple podcast that I do that's just general Apple news. And you can get it at Apple Things. Apple Things by MaxFuture.com on iTunes. So let's get to it. This was a big week. Uh, Apple announced earlier this week uh, subscription terms, finally, both for the iPhone App Store and the iPad App Store, and for all apps. And people were waiting for this, and Apple released key terms. Now, up till now, there hadn't been subscriptions, and I talked about this on the Apple podcast at, mu- at much more length, if you want to hear it there. But, you know, there hadn't really been subscription terms, and this had been a problem for magazines and newspapers that were available in the App Store, because you had to buy each edition of a magazine, say the New Yorker, you know, each week and pay each week $5, and you couldn't like get a discount by signing up for like a year's worth and have them just automatically be downloaded. And the first time Apple allowed this was with the daily app that Rupert Burdock's company released on the iPad a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, that's the news core. And the daily is a daily uh, newspaper app. And um, the first few weeks it's free. And it basically downloads a newspaper every day. Uh, but the terms of the subscription are going to be you can uh, buy a, a one-week subscription for just $0.99 cents or a one-year subscription for $40. So Apple then this week made this announced that this, this subscription uh, plan and, and tools for developers to put subscription in an app are going to be available very soon. And they're going to be available not just for um, newspapers and magazines, but others. So Apple announced key terms. So what are the key terms? Let's get to the heart of it. The key terms are that any subscription that people sign up for in the app, Apple is going to take 30% cut. Now that 30% cut is similar to the cut Apple takes for selling an app in the App Store. Um, Now the key is, though, it's only for originated subscriptions in the app and Apple's not going to take any percentage for subscriptions that are initiated outside the app so for subscriptions out of the app there is not going to be any cut taken so for example if let's take the Netflix app if you sign up for the Netflix outside of the app well then then Apple's not going to take a cut and another key term is that um, the comp- the app publisher has to uh, offer an in-app su- subscription where the, the publisher offers an out-of-app subscription. So what this means, and why a lot of people are sort of freaking out, is that you know Amazon, uh, in its Kindle app, you have to go outside the Kindle app to sign up for, uh, to buy books. Actually, Amazon doesn't do subscriptions, but let's take Netflix. You have a movie streaming service. Well, you have to go outside of the Netflix app to sign up for it. So what Apple is saying, if you offer it outside, you have to offer it inside. And here's the key thing. The in-app price can't be higher uh, than the subscribing outside the app. Uh, you know, and, and again, the, to make it clear, you can sign up outside the app to have the service in the app, uh, but the point is you can't just do it outside the app and not and avoid the 30% cut. You have to give customers the option of signing up within Apple's app and Apple getting the 30% cut. And um, and this also applies, uh, word is out that, uh, to sales, not just in-app sales also. Well, the EU supposedly was also looking into antitrust violations but um, 
word came out. Now the EU is the European Commission, but word came out, I guess, from one legislator in, well, I don't know, Belgium, who basically said something to the effect that they don't think there's a problem because, like, as I said, the iPad has competition and um, there is competition with the Android. So I don't think the EU is going to be really looking at any significant problems, you know, because obviously the iPad has competition. All sorts of stuff is coming out. The Zoom, the the uh, Galaxy Tab. Anyways, let's move on. So another story that was out this week that affects the iPad is a big story that Apple is buying up touch screens. And... Um, uh, this is a typo, but uh, Apple apparently had over 60% of global supply. That's supposed to, that five is supposed to be percent sign in 2011. And this story, which came out on February 17th, is from DigiTimes website via Mac Rumors. And according to the story, I mean, you know, Apple's buying up the very important touch screens that you need to make a tablet computer, and. Um, Basically, second tier, second tier players, people who are second tier developers of tablets, are screwed. So remember, Apple at its last quarterly announcement announced that it prepaid three point nine billion dollars to secure certain um, supplies for making stuff. It didn't say what, but previously Apple had bought Flash for the iPod. This is several years ago, billions of dollars. So, you know, this is one way that Apple stays ahead of the competition, which is it has a tremendous cash hoard and can use that cash hoard to make strategic pur purchases. Another big story that came out is that Apple is going to overhaul MobileMe. Now, MobileMe is, you know, the, the web service that you can subscribe to at full price. It's $99. And I think this story is significant for the iPad. And why is it significant for iPad? Well, first, this story is attributed to Cult of Mac website. It came out February 16th. And um, the overhaul is going to be significant because, you know, I think by giving more tools with MobileMe and making it more robust, it's going to make the iPad experience much better. So, you know, I can't wait to hear what that's going to be. You know, I, I think there may be, you might have the ability to, um, to I don't know, store stuff from your iPad more easily to MobileMe. Maybe uh, one thing is you could have a music streaming service built into MobileMe. Whatever is done with the cloud is going to help the iPad is my view. So uh, another story is that um, uh, mobile ad impressions are up on the iPhone and iPad. And that's significant because, you know, Apple has a huge competition in the Android market from Google. So apparently, um, you know, there was a story on February 15th from... Pad Gadget. I've never heard of that website before, but apparently it was the largest month-to-month -month growth in ad impressions on the iPad and the iPhone. And Pad Gadget was reporting on a report from Millennium Millennial Media, and Millennial Media, I guess, who tracks stuff like that, had a January report which said that the iPhone and iPad outpaced outpaced other OS's and that the iPhone and iPad combination had a 47 percent increase month over month in ad impressions. Now Apple's rival Android, the Android Google operating system, had ad increases but only up 32 percent. So that, you know, people thought that Android was going to just swamp the iPhone and the iPad, but uh, so far the iPad and the iPhone as a platform are holding their own. Okay, so other stories. Now this is really crazy. Um, 
the overheating lawsuit has been dismissed against Apple. Now, what is the overheating lawsuit? Now, this is really nuts. And this was reported in eWeek. Well, I don't know if you recall, but back in the summer, some people who purchased the iPad were upset because they claimed that in the sunlight, it overheated. And they filed a suit. They sought a class action. And that was filed in a district court in California. But fortunately, a smart judge, Judge Jeremy Fogel, he threw out the case. And, and um, again, this was a class action. It was filed in July 2010. Now, these three individuals claimed the iPad overheated in warm weather, in direct sunlight. And the three plaintiffs claimed that the iPad was not like a book, claimed not like a real book. And then the judge said that these claims were inadequate, you know, because the, their whole claim is that they thought they were buying something like a real book, but a real book has no electricity in it, and the iPad does. And the judge says that they're going to give them another chance to replead the case, which means to file it again, but they need to identify ads that Apple said it's like a real book. You know, I think this is a silly lawsuit. Frankly, I don't know about you, but my iPad is actually cool. I mean, it's much cooler than any laptop. I've been using laptops and computers for a long time. The iPad barely heats up. All right, let's move on. Uh, another story, which really, again, every week we see this. Every week we see how the iPad is penetrating the business market the enterprise market. And the latest is a story about Jetstar Airline, I guess. And this comes via the TUAW.com website, the unofficial Apple web log.com. And apparently Jetstar is a Australian airline. And they like the iPad so much that they're renting out iPads to, to passengers for $10 per flight. And again, they have it loaded with music. They have it loaded with magazines. They have it loaded with books and movies. I skipped over that. And games. Pretty much everything you want on a flight to keep you busy. And uh, they're going to be on Jetstar's E320 flights, which are in Australia and in Asia. And I got to tell you, I think, I think that makes total sense. $10 a rental is actually kind of cheap because on a lot of airlines now, they, they charge you at least $5 for um, a movie. And it's a really crappy movie usually. Like I've been flying with the iPad and my screen is much better than any screen I've ever seen on an airline. Uh, like, And I actually see now a lot of people carrying um, iPads on on an airplane so obviously it makes sense for the airlines to rent them out now let's see there's other news this news that uh, affects the next iPad which is going to be the iPad 2 as well as the next iPhone which will be the iPhone 5 and this news comes via uh, itportal.com and the story is that these two devices which are going to be coming out in the coming months are going to have different processors and I guess um, the story is via DigiTimes again the Taiwanese tech website <coughs> and um, the story is that Apple is moving away from Samsung because Samsung is a competitor now Samsung has been previously supplying processors but here's the thing. According to this, the iPad 2 will be getting an enhanced A4 processor, which it is essentially the current processor on the iPad is an A4. While the iPhone 5, which is probably going to come out in June, is going to get something known as the A5 chip, which is going to be the next generation chip. And that chip is going to run the ARM Cortex Let's go back to that ARM Cortex A9 based processor, which is dual core, two processors, which the current iPad does not have, and it's clocked at one gigahertz. 
And here's the big kicker. That A5 chip is going to be three times the performance of the A4. And Samsung uses um, ARM's Mali graphics in the Galaxy tab and not Apple's Apple-backed PowerVR tech f from um, Imagination Technologies. So the point of this article also is that Samsung and Apple are going their separate routes. Samsung has been a supplier for Apple's iPad and iPhone, but the point of this article is that, look, Samsung now is making the Galaxy tab and it's competing with Apple. So Apple is sort of abandoning maybe Samsung. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, um, the other thing is what's interesting is that these people are saying that the iPad 2 will not have as good a processor as the iPad, um, the iPhone 5. And there have been stories out, multiple stories, that we may see the iPad 3 in September or October. Now that would then make sense that the iPad 2 would not get as good a uh, processor as the iPhone 5 because look at the timing. The iPad 2 is supposed to come out in March or April. The iPhone 5 is supposed to come out in June and the iPad 3 is in September. It would make sense to hold off and giving the better processor uh, to the iPad 3. And uh, I think they're Going forth, they're going to really, we talked about this last week, Apple's going to have the general upgrades for the iPad occur after the iPhone. So we may see just a modest step up in the iPad in March and then a bigger step up, uh, step up in um, September. All right, so how about a smaller iPad 2? Now this has been going back and forth. 9to5Mac.com had a story on February 18th saying that there's going to be a 6-inch iPad. And this is via a site called SuperApple.cz claims this. And that Apple's working on two models with screen size close to 6 inches. And another one 5.7 inch and just below 6 inches. <clears throat> so these are from two sources, and they say that this is going to come out in mid-2011. Now, Jobs said uh, that there would not be something smaller than the iPad, but I always scratched my head on that because, my God, the iPod Touch is like an iPad, just the same size as an iPhone. So if you're going to have an iPod Touch, which is small, why wouldn't you have... Um, why wouldn't you have a um, something in between the size of the iPod Touch and the iPad? So I think I think this is credible. Look, I'm convinced at some point Apple will come out with uh, a touch device that's between the 9.7 inch screen of the iPad and the three and a half inch screen of the current iPhone 4. Okay, so the next story may concern uh, two new changes to the to the uh, iPad and uh, the changes are going to be the um, well smart bezel and a longer battery life and this comes via the website CNET UK Crave and this story was out on February 18th and uh, ultimately was from Patently Apple. So what's the bezel story? Well, the bezel is that part of the front part of the iPad that's not glass, that's not the screen. And basically the story is that the bezel it could include in the future sensors so that you could actually do things like swipe on the bezel and trigger things. You could touch, tap, hold, and squeeze and you could do tri triggering actions. So that's pretty cool. Um, I think that's something that, um, you know, I've talked about, not the bezel, I've talked about how, you know, uh, and you could also swipe for volume, and you could double tap for wake, and there would be no home button. In other words, the bezel itself. 
Now, I've talked about this in the past, not the bezel, but the back side, the flat back side of the iPad or the iPhone. I always said, well, why couldn't that be used as a touch device? And you could trigger stuff. And because think about it, like if you hold the iPad with two hands, it would go around the side. So I think this makes sense with the bezel. Now, the story is that, you know, this is going to come out in iPad 3 or iPad 4. So an, another part of that story was that Apple is working on rechargeable lithium battery cells, which would be really, really powerful and last long. Something called CC-CV, which stands for Constant Current Constant Voltage. I'm not sure what it does, but the bottom line is it would extend the battery of an iPad or an iPhone. Now look, the iPad already has a tremendous battery. It lasts a full 10 hours. Um, so if they can improve the battery, that would be great. Now another story was that there was an iPad 2 survey done on the Wall Street Journal's website. And I took it on February 18th. And the question was, are you waiting for the iPad 2? Now 12.4% said, yes, I will upgrade. 59.8% uh, said, yes, I will buy for the first time. And 11.6% said, no, I'm good with current iPad. And 16.35% said, will not get, don't have one. Now, I took this exam. I mean, I took this quiz. But what's interesting is there's a whole bunch of people who don't have an iPad, more than 50% surveyed, who said that they would buy the iPad 2. So there could be a huge surge of buying for the iPad 2. Remember, there's a lot of people who don't like to buy the first time some new device comes out and they want to wait for something, you know, refined. So they'll wait for, wait for the second version. Now, at the time that I took the quiz, at least 17,000 people responded. So when I voted, all right. Now, the other, um, the other interesting story concerns the reduction of the 15-minute window. Now, this story is from GigaOM, and it came out on February 17th. Now, this story concerns children, and it's the App Store. And apparently, I know exactly what's going on here, because like when you buy something in the App Store and you use your password, well, that password's good for 15 minutes. So let's say you bought a game app for your kid on the iPad, and for 15 minutes, that, app, that password's going to be good, which means... If um, you know, if you get one of these freemium apps, a lot of the games for kids are free. But then within the app, you can buy upgrades. And the problem is, if you download and use your password to get the freemium app, then you give it to your kid. Next thing you know, your kid's making a lot of in-app purchases without your approval. So they may reduce the time of the password to cut it down so that it only lasts, let's say, five minutes. So that way parents, uh, you know, don't get screwed. Now, one legislature also raised the issue. So it's the government's also looking at this. Uh, and in this story that I read, at least one child racked up $375 worth of in-app purchases. And the congressman who's interested in, in maybe narrowing this is Congressman Edward Markey. He urged the FTC to do something about children you know clicking buttons and buying within apps so th what could come out is less time i'm for that i really think you know i'm for that i would also like like a button like where you could you could shut it off like like i could i could um you know i could go to the settings and say okay i'm now giving it to the kid so the so i'm shutting off any ability to put it in a password that would be the best fix um, you know, I, Apple does require a password each time, but the problem is it lasts for 15 minutes. Now, going back to the enterprise stories, Malaysia Airlines uh, also, according to 9to5Mac, has launched an in-flight magazine. So they're not giving out I app iPads, but they've created an iPad app. Uh, so in other words, you know, all these airlines have their own flight magazines and I guess so many people are flying on Malaysia airport airlines with an iPad that the airlines decided to create an, a magazine app and it's you know like all magazine apps it's more interactive and the quote is 
Uh, MAS chose the iPad because of the phenomenal growth. Okay, that's a good quote. Now, Vogue, there's a Vogue app now, and um, Condé Nast, which has a number of, uh, of magazine apps, released the Vogue app, and this comes via the Mac Observer website on February 18th, and it's the first iPad, iPad app, uh, and it, and it made by Vogue, and it's the Vogue cover exclusive, and this issue focuses on cover models, and has I exclusive interviews and photos from the cover shoot and videos and the first issue focuses on Lady Gaga so you know and it has behind the scenes of the her concert tour and you know I like this the price is only 99 cents so I'm pretty happy with that I think that's a good um, that's a good outcome now it's unclear if with the Vogue app magazine you can you can get subscriptions but we know subscriptions are coming so anyways I think that's good good stuff okay so um, one of the apps that I want to really talk about that came out this week is the pennant app it's five bucks and it was mentioned by John Gruber of Daring Fireball and also by Sarah Lane of the Leo Laporte's Twit Network. And the Pennant app um, is this very cool baseball, if you're a big baseball fan, app. And basically, there's a video up on pennant.cc that shows you what it can do. But basically, it's it's got every team and every game that was ever played in Major League Baseball from 1951 to... 2010 and the app allows you to go back and find for every team and every and you know every game and essentially relive the game and you can quickly scroll like you can pick let's say the Philadelphia Phillies this is what they show on the video and you could scroll all the way back in that time period from between 1951 and 2010 and find a game but the thing is, it's not its not like you got videos or anything like that. Rather, you've got statistics and a sort of unique interface with like a scroll timeline. And then, you know, lots of statistics. And you can quickly scroll through time and see the statistics change. It's very, it's very innovative. I've never seen anything really like this. And then you can pick the Phillies and you've got... Um, the game, let's say October 23rd, 1993 against the Toronto Blue Jays. And if you go around this circle, which is the stats, nine innings of the game, as you scroll your finger around this like circle, you see the results as they unfolded in that game very quickly. So you can relive the game. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very cool. Um, the interface you can also drill down to particular individuals and it'll show you you know here the 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 screen shows you the the results of you know Paul Molitor got a hit and but it's what's what's very cool about the app it's, it's very quick and very responsive at least that's what the video um, on the website of, of using the app shows you and um, you can just then have it like play a, a game again and it'll go quickly through the game and show you, you know, essentially what happened. So all in all, I think this is really innovative. It's only $5 and so if you're a football fan, a baseball fan, you should think about getting it. Uh, it you know, the season's about to start. Okay, one of the apps that I really want to um, get or I'm thinking of getting is, a, is an app by a German company that's an astronomy company and it's called Redshift and I've heard great things about this and it goes for I guess uh, 12 bucks and it's, it works both on the iPad and the, and the iPhone and basically it has like a galaxy and you have the you can sort of fly through the galaxy and, and set a course 
like from planet to stars, and you can also point it at the sky and it'll show you what's in that night sky. But I think the really cool part is that um, you can, you know, you can fly through the universe with this thing. Also, a lot of the data is integrated with Wikipedia, and there's more than a hundred thousand stars that are lost. So, I don't know. I'm going to check it out. I think it's worth it. Okay, so one of the um, stories that, you know, continue to evolve as we head in t- into uh, Saturday or Sunday, February 20th, is the whole issue of what's going to be different between the iPad 3 that a lot of people think is going to come out in, um, in uh, the fall and the iPad 2. And Apple Insider had a story here. Uh, that basically says that the iPad 3 will have an retina display, in other words, a better display than the iPad currently has. And um, basically, uh, you know, it says that uh, uh, it quotes an analyst, um, an analyst by the name of Ming Chi Kuo of Concord Securities, who supposedly informed Apple Insider of detailed component plans attributed to iPad 2. And uh, Quo said that a successive iPad 3 model would um, incorporate a 9.7 inch uh, IPS panel with FF fringe field switching technology which enables a wider viewing angle and clearer visual quality under sunlight so in other words the iPad 2 might not have more pixels but it may have um, better I guess resolution in sunlight so the iPad 2 will continue to have only a 960 by 640 display but Quo, Quo, this this Concord Securities analyst, now claims that iPad 2 uh, will deliver a retina display-like quality and resolution doubling to 2048 times 1536, an enhancement originally thought to make it into the more immediate release of iPad 2. So this is a very interesting story on Apple Insider's website. Quo, according to the uh, article, told Apple Insider last month that iPad 2 isn't getting the new panel yet because of limited manufacturing yield rates. Now, you know, I find this, I find this uh, credible. Why do I find it credible? Because I do think it would be kind of hard for Apple to quickly scale to such a, an intense pixel concentration so quickly. I think it's hard to get the huge quantities of such screens out so quickly after the initial release of the iPad. And Apple, I think if Apple is going to come out with iPad 3 in the fall, it's going to want to save something for iPad 3 to make it exciting. So here's what I think is going to happen. iPad 2 is going to be a little lighter. It's going to be have more memory. It's going to have uh, at least 516 uh, megabytes of RAM. It's going to have uh, a faster processor, but probably just this A4, souped up A4, and it's going to have cameras. And then I bet you it's going to have a slightly better screen in terms of the sunlight, but not more resolution. And then I bet you in the fall they'll go with the this high 
density retina screen of 2048 times 1536 and they'll come out with the A5 processor that they'll have in the iPhone 5 in the iPad. Okay, so one of the big pieces of news this week, uh, or actually today on the 20th, is that you know Apple's first major competitor maybe for the iPad is coming out this Thursday. Because um, on February 20th, Best Buy's website started taking pre-orders for the Motorola Zoom. And the Motorola Zoom is going to go for, look at this, 800 bucks, $799.99. And it's going to have Android's latest iPad or tablet ready uh, Android, that's Honeycomb designed specifically for tablets. It's going to have a large 10.1 widescreen HD display. It's going to be super fast according to the website with dual core processor. It's going to have front and rear facing cameras, multitask. Uh, it's going to have an HD camcorder and it supports uh, Adobe Flash, but you also have to get a monthly, uh, I think you have to get a monthly plan with it and um, yeah there look at the asterisk one month data activation required uh, so maybe you just have to get one month and not a committed plan um, and it's going to be available on Thursday February 24th at Best Buy now the website Electronista I think tried out the Zoom and I think they found it to be a little heavy it's a little heavier than the iPad, but it felt a little buggy, uh, bulky, and it also felt, according to that website, I guess they tried it out at Mobile World Congress, it also felt a little sluggish. Uh, it didn't feel zippy, like scrolling through it and, and doing different things. So we're now entering a period where you're going to actually be able to walk into um, stores and see... 10 inch tablets that purportedly compete with the iPad so look for people who like the iPad this is a great thing because this means that there's going to be pressure on Apple to really ramp up and increase the specs on the iPad you know so I, I mean I think this is all the more reason to think there's going to be an iPad 2 coming out in late March and an iPad 3 in the fall because this is just one competitor. Then you have the Galaxy Tab, and you've got Hewitt Packard's coming out with the Touchpad this summer. So there's going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of competition. But look, this is it. The first one, the, the Motorola Zoom at Best Buy. Do you want to see, um, look, there are some comments already. Uh, eight reviews. Let's see what the reviews say. Should we check it out? Okay. Uh, the reviews. Hmm. Uh, I have to scroll down. Well, I can't find any reviews. Well, interesting, it only has a 32 gigabyte hard drive. The top end iPad has a 64 gigabyte hard drive. Uh, anyways, I don't know. It'll be worth checking out. I'm going to go into my Best Buy and, and try it out. Okay, so one of the more humorous stories, or a story that shows the iPad continues to be penetrating the enterprise market, is a story from this website called DailyBreeze.com, I guess, which is the newspaper uh, in Torrance, California, or from uh, Los Angeles Airport to Los Angeles uh, Harbor. And here's the, the headline is order pad will be an iPad at stacked restaurant. And I guess there's a chain of restaurants called stacked that's in like the Torrance area in the South Bay and stacked is the first of what is going to offer, um, you know, it's going to offer the diners will design their meal on an iPad that will sit on each table, no server needed not quite fast food although the average bill per person will be under ten dollars 
the industry category is called Fast Casual Plus. And according to the co-founder, Paul Motenko, in this article, you create your meal visually on the screen, and when you're satisfied with what you've built, you send it to the kitchen. So each table is going to have, like, I guess, a an iPad docked. Um, uh, so, so I'll have to see how this goes, and I guess, um, you know, you can, um, swap ingredients in and out, and, um, you know, it might be kind of gimmicky, but I think you're going to see more of this, where the iPad becomes a sort of a menu and an ordering, ordering screen. Finally, it's, um... I guess we're entering Oscar time. Introducing a and, new way um, to experience the Oscars. There is a 99 Oscar cent backstage app pass. That's called Oscar Backstage Pass is a revolutionary pass. app available for iPhone, it's gonna iPod help you, Touch, I guess, enjoy and the iPad. Oscars. That gives and, you the um, ultimate insider view of Hollywood's biggest night. Backstage Pass offers of different experiences before, actors, during, and the after the Oscars. The movies, Here's what's in store. Historical stuff. On the days leading up to the 83rd and, Academy um, Awards, you can relive some of the best moments in Oscar history. You can go back in time and Watch nominations prior coverage, Oscar moments, and experience original video series and, taking you, you know, behind the scenes of this year's show. Backstage stuff then, relating to the once the countdown that timer been, reaches uh, zero on the nominated, night of the Oscars, and there's a backstage countdown, pass countdown clock automatically switching modes to the and transporting you directly to the red carpet in Hollywood. And it also there's a red carpet part of the app, so you can see where people you are get on the red to carpet. Live camera streams from exclusive cameras and uh, during, during the, the red, red carpet. carpet to get any closer, you have to be there part, You can get certain information Next, on, once the on the actors who are going down it. And during the show, Pacific, there's all sorts of information. You, as you, watch the telecast on ABC. you can... Um, You'll automatically be taken inside the Kodak Theater. You, you, get, you can actually see what's going on in the, the theater. That you control. And I guess you're going to get some backstage stuff. Once the stuff. show is over, the fun is just getting so, started with backstage pass. I mean, Head I like the Oscars, and this looks like a really cool way to get... Check out video highlights from Get the night, stuff. and even watch it also as the has Oscar after party engraved with the winners' names, and all, live all sorts of stuff about how they make the Oscar material. Welcome to the most so, interactive um, Oscars ever. I don't know. It looks like it's worth getting. So, look, the iPad just invades everybody's life. Well, this was episode 42 of the iPad podcast from the MaxFuture.com website. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. Max Future. Yeah.